My name is Vinky Lumba. I'm a commercial real estate investor, and I love to work with you all. And I'm always looking for good opportunities in the real estate for myself and my investors. And uh, today, let's please welcome Corey Tahirsh, a seasoned business development specialist and a certified IRA specialist. And he has over 10 years of experience in financial industry. He's known for his passion for financial literacy and ability to simplify complex investment strategies. Corey is adept at educating and empowering audience with his insight into self-directed retirement investing. And today we'll talk about unlocking financial freedom, understanding SDRA and checkbook control. But before we get started, I'm gonna go through a small little disclaimer. Let me share my screen real quick. This session is strictly for knowledge sharing purposes and should not be considered as a legal accounting or investment advice. This session does not represent an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to purchase an investment or security. So if you have any tax related questions or any investment related questions, reach out to your financial advisors. Um, let's stop this. And before we get started, we have a couple of housekeeping items as well. If you have a question, please use the Q&A box. Put your question there. We'll try to get to your, all your questions. And if you miss anything, please um, send me an email at thinky at lumbainvest.com. And also you can whitelist my email so I can get your email and reply back with the answer that you're looking for. So welcome again, Corey. Stage is all yours. All right. Thank you so much, Pinky. I appreciate you for having me. Um, let me make sure my presentation, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Are you able to uh, allow me to? There we go. Okay. And let's just confirm. Are you seeing my presentation screen now? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Let me just make sure I have my version to move it. There we go. All right, so everyone, I'm here just to talk a little bit about self-directed retirement accounts in general, and then I'm going to hyper-focus today specifically on the checkbook control strategy or the single-member LLC strategy, which is a very diverse tool that a lot of investors can use to put the power of their retirement dollars in their hands even more so than you do with a standard self-directed account. Uh, so as Vinky mentioned, I've been in the self-directed space specifically for about seven years now. This is my eighth year, 2024, but I've got an even longer history in the financial industry. I've been working in uh, banks and credit unions prior to joining an Avanta IRA. I have a degree in business management. I'm very uh, close to a degree in accounting as well, but I decided I did not want to be an accountant. So uh, I let that one kind of go one semester away from having an uh, associate's, I'm sorry, a bachelor's degree in accounting also. Uh, you can contact me if you have any questions or concerns from the self-directed side of things, and I'll be very happy to connect with you and answer however uh, I can help. So Advanta IRA, as a self-directed administrator, has been in business for 21 years now. We've got uh, just under $3 billion in assets under management. We're expecting to cross that threshold by the end of this calendar year, so we'll have over $3 billion in assets under management held by our clients. Uh, all of our clients are paired with a dedicated client account manager. So it's not like your larger wirehouse retirement companies where you have to call a call center or a, a big uh, branch division and not know who you're going to speak with. Everyone that's a client of ours has a dedicated account manager that's their go-to person for any questions via email or phone call. You get an answer back within one day. And I served in that role for a number of years. You really get to build continuity with your account manager. When they say, see your number calling in or an email from you, they usually get a good gauge after just a few conversations of what you're looking for, either in answering your questions about investments or how they can best help you. So we try to provide as best we can, like a white glove concierge style um, service for our clients. So my agenda today specifically is just going to be covering a quick overview of the rules and regulations and how and why people set up self-directed accounts. And then I'm going to jump into checkbook control, which again is a single member LLC owned by your retirement account. It basically gives you a debit card or a checkbook to use your own retirement dollars into whatever investment strategies you want. So you're not waiting on someone else to execute deals. You have the full control with that strategy. I'm going to tell you how to set it up. 
some legal considerations and some additional considerations as you're getting the plan set up. And then we'll take any questions towards the end if you have any. Uh, Binky, if you're keeping an eye on the questions as well, feel free to interject if you notice any that are relevant as I'm going. Definitely. So my disclaimer, very similar uh, to Vinky's disclaimer, I'm not here to provide tax advice, legal advice, or financial advice. We are strictly self-directed retirement account experts at Advanta IRA. I have what's known as a CISP designation. I'm a certified IRA services professional. I've held that designation since 2018. It does require continuing education. So I'm always up to date in what the IRS rules and regulations are. And uh, again, if you need your own legal counsel, financial counsel, or fiduciary counsel, please build your team and seek those representatives as you see fit. Now, if you've not heard about self-directed investing, it's okay. That's actually really common. Of the grand scheme of US-based retirement accounts, the industry has about just under 40 trillion, that's trillion with a T, $40 trillion in it. And only about 1.5 trillion or roughly 4% are currently being self-directed. Again, Advanta is just under 3 billion of that. So we're a, a medium to mid-sized company in the grand scheme of things, but the industry in itself is not that big in the grand scheme because most people just simply don't know these options exist. They're either with a fiduciary or financial advisory custodian that maybe shies them away from self-direction because they'd prefer that money to stay in their hands where they're managing it and charging you a rate or a fee for their services. Uh, we're just here to make sure people know you can do this and let you take that information as you will. If it's a good fit for you to self-direct your retirement dollars, great, we're here to help. If not, at least we're a good steward of our industry and we're sharing the information and letting you share that with others that you know that may benefit from this type of investing strategies. So there are a number of different types of plans that can be self-directed. Most people are commonly familiar with your traditional or your Roth IRAs. But if you're a small business owner with little to no employees, you can also have what's called a SEP IRA or a simple IRA. If you have no employees, maybe a business that just you and potentially your spouse operate, you can have a solo 401k plan, which is a great plan. It's equivalent to uh, some, some people know it as a qualified retirement plan or an EQRP. There's different plans just like it. It's the same thing as a solo 401k plan. It's where you and your spouse, there's no W-2 wage earners in the sponsoring entity are able to set up an account, contribute much higher than you can into a traditional or Roth IRA. And there's some other additional benefits from a tax perspective and a leverage perspective for those plans too. We're not here to get specifically into those, but if you have interest, just reach out to me and I can send you some great content and resources. Also, aside from the IRA and employer-sponsored plans, you can have a health savings account that you self-direct or an education savings account that you self-direct. So a health savings account can be a, a single account or a family account for someone that has a high deductible health policy. And an education savings account is very similar to the 529 plans people are familiar with. It lets you set aside money for young ones in your life, uh, educational expenses. If they don't use the full balance of the plan by the time they are done with their educational expenses or reach the age uh, that the limit out is, then they can actually transfer it over to next of kin. So you can hand that off to another relative that could benefit from that money in that specific education savings account. So why do people choose to self-direct? Well, first off, again, it's a new source of capital. If you're already doing some investing like real estate syndication or really any unique investments and you find out that you can use your retirement dollars towards it, why not with a diversification tactic, put some of your retirement dollars into some of the strategies and some of the, the resources and tools you already have in your tool belt for investing and making more money. A lot of people find fatigue in the stock market with the fluctuations, the upturns, the downturns, and just don't want to be on the public sector anymore with stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. And then there's the tax benefit as well. When you're making investments with your retirement account, the account itself is seen as a disregarded entity for tax purposes. So the investments you make with that account 
carry through that disregarded tax status. So when you're talking about real estate, there's no capital gains to be paid when your investment grows and you sell an investment in a retirement account. Uh, when you're talking about other asset classes as well, you're sheltered from a lot of taxation. Now, there are some tax benefits that you don't get when you use a retirement account, like depreciation or bonus depreciation. Uh, so there's an ebb and flow of what you're benefiting by using retirement dollars and what you're losing out on by the tax benefits that are given to you for using your, uh, your own savings monies. So the rules around retirement investing are simple. Don't let anyone trick you and make you think that they're difficult or too complex to know what you can and cannot invest into. It's as simple as this. You cannot use your retirement dollars to invest into a life insurance policy, hard to value collectibles like antiques or fine wine, anything that would be subjective in value. You cannot use your retirement account to hold those types of assets. And then precious metals or coins, there's only a certain number of precious metals that you're allowed to invest into. It's mostly non-circulating uh, coins like silver bullion, gold eagle, um, Iraqi dinar, things like that you can invest into with your retirement dollars. That's a pretty niche uh, investment strategy. So if you have interest in those types of assets, again, reach out. I've got plenty of resources. I'd be happy to point your way, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. With the other side of the IRS regulations, they limit who you can invest with or who you can invest through more specifically. By determining certain people in your lineage as disqualified persons. A disqualified person is basically anyone on your family tree, specifically up and down. And those are individuals you cannot transact with, meaning I can't buy a piece of property that is owned by my father. I can't let my son rent or be a tenant in a property that my retirement account owns. That also extends to businesses that these individuals may own or operate and control day-to-day -day decisions for. The next slide is actually going to paint a great picture for you, but just for context, prohibited transactions are based off of disqualified persons or prohibited investments, so specific assets that you're not supposed to invest into. Aside from everything I just said there, you can basically structure whatever investment you'd like with your retirement dollars. You just need to have a conversation with an account manager or someone on our team that helps you strategize and know how to accommodate that investment. And that's what we're experts in and what we're here for. There are some tax considerations I have here on this slide as well. There's two taxes called UBIT or unrelated business income tax. If the investments you make are not necessarily 100% passive in income structure, they're generating a little bit more active income, you may be subject to UBIT tax. Uh, for example, if you invest into maybe a laundromat or a car wash potentially, or, or something that's, again, generating a little bit more active than passive income, or unrelated debt financed income, UDFI, is associated when you use leverage in your retirement account to make an investment. So if you're going to go buy a piece of property or join a larger investment deal and they're using financing, there's a potential that UDFI tax may be involved. Again, we're not here to provide specific tax advice, but we do have resources just for your better understanding. Reach out to me if you'd like anything there. I can definitely provide that. Uh, and one other thing that's a callback to something I said earlier, the solo 401k plans are not subject to UDFI. So if you're someone looking to make an investment that may utilize leverage, it's probably in your best interest to see if a solo 401k plan is a good fit for you because you then are not subject to UDFI tax. So uh, there is a question in the chat. I'm sorry, I'm going to stop you right here for a second. And also, I wanted to ask you one question on this UDFI or UBIT tax. So can we use the depreciation or the bonus depreciation that we get from our investments to write some off or no? So the write-off component is not necessarily flowing through to the retirement account. It, it, and Vicky, I'm assuming you're speaking from like a general partner standpoint, correct? Exactly. Or even the limited partners too, they get the deposition as well. So typically, no, that cannot be utilized as a write-off tool or, or um, factor. Um, when UDFI comes to play from a larger scale investment, like a syndication, 
usually the syndications tax team will figure out the best strategies to mitigate or completely absolve the UDFI tax that would be applicable. I don't know the specifics. Again, I'm not a tax matter expert, so I don't know the specifics of how that occurs and what takes place. Uh, but usually with syndication, UDFI is a non-factor. Um, it comes more so into play when people want to use a few hundred thousand dollars or something in their retirement account to buy a property that's worth a few more hundred thousand dollars. So they're actually effectively taking a mortgage out in the name of their retirement account. So if you're someone that that everything I just said sounds like a strategy you'd like to partake in, ideally, you're doing that through a solo 401k plan so that you can completely avoid the UDFI tax even being a component. There's another question. It says, uh, do UBIT apply to flipping businesses as they are an active form of real estate investments? I would probably need a little bit more clarification as to what um, flipping businesses in that question means. Are you meaning you're buying an active business, you're trying to improve that active business, and then you're, you're selling it? If that's the case, um, okay, that, that person said house flipping. House flipping. Um, UBIT would not apply to house flipping. Um, it's basically just you're buying a piece of property, you're utilizing uh, additional assets in your retirement account or through partnerships or through joint venture agreements to improve the property, and then you're selling it. Uh, UBIT does not apply in most cases. The only time UBIT may even in any capacity come to play there is if you're operating a full-on flipping business, meaning you're flipping there's no black and white rule on this, but the rule of thumb, at least on my team that we tell people is about 10 to 12. If you're flipping more than 10 to 12 houses a year, you're going to want to speak with your tax preparer and verify if UBIT is something you should file for or not. But if you're just flipping three or four houses in your retirement account in any given year or you know upwards to that mark of 10, UBIT is not going to apply. And also, as I mentioned earlier, you're not subject to capital gains tax when you sell those properties properties out of the retirement account either. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Charles says, I marks for honest deal like that. Thanks, Charles, <laughs> <laughs> because we're discussing UDFI already. <laughs> yeah, I, I try to be as straightforward and direct as I can. And, and uh, I also, you'll notice I've said it a few times, there's a few things that I don't even want to touch my, my toes in that I'm just not a well-versed expert in. So I'm not going to um, sit here in front of the audience and make it sound like I know the right answer. I, I'm very direct and honest with where my expertise is lie. So hopefully you guys appreciate that. Thanks. We do appreciate that. Um, so just back to the, uh, the visual representation here of the disqualified persons list. Again, it's really anyone up and down your family tree, the main trunk of your family tree, including your spouse and specifically also including any businesses that those individuals own, which means controlling 50, 50 or more percent stake in uh, or make day-to-day -day decisions for. So if let's say my dad doesn't own 50% or more of a business, but he has some uh, board of director role where he makes day-to-day -day decisions, I shouldn't be transacting with that business with my retirement account. So um, hopefully that paints a very clear picture and kind of wraps up the rules side of today's presentation. Uh, we're going to jump more specifically now into checkbook control, which is kind of the nuts and bolts of what we're here to talk about, the checkbook IRA, also known as single member LLC strategy. So with this strategy, what you're really doing is establishing an LLC that is wholly owned by your retirement account and managed by yourself and or anyone else you would like to appoint as managers. You can have a business partner as a manager as well. You can have a, a spouse or another relative as a business manager to the LLC, but it's basically set up. So the only membership of it is your retirement account and the management is delineated to you and your appointees. And this is different from a custodial account because with a custodial account, you just have an IRA with a company, Advanta IRA, for example. And whenever you want to do a new investment transaction or need activity done for the investments you already hold, you have to come to us, your account manager, as I referenced earlier, to facilitate those things. We're very fast at that. Nonetheless, sometimes people want to do faster deals. You might want to go to an auction and buy property at your local county jurisdiction. 
uh, you may be networking and, and really have a last minute chance to sign into a syndication, uh, but this is over the weekend at a conference or, or something like that may take place. For any reason, if you want direct control of your retirement dollars, the checkbook control strategy is the way to do it. It allows you to have direct access to the money. It also puts more onus on you, though, to not conduct any prohibited transactions or interact with disqualified persons as I went over earlier. When you have checkbook control, there's no one overseeing your account or overseeing the activities or behaviors until or unless you're audited and you don't wanna find out in an audit that you've already done something prohibited. Not that we ever see audits that often, if at all, but just make sure you're preparing yourself uh, when you're utilizing checkbook control for the rules and regulations. We're here as a resource. Our clients have account managers, even when they have checkbook control, to reach out to and say, hey, I thought about doing this with my checkbook IRA, or hey, I'm thinking about doing this in the next few weeks. What are some precautions I should be aware of? That's what we're here for. We're not here to tell you how to invest your money. That's what you're an expert in. That's why it's self-directed investing. So again, checkbook control is an LLC in itself that's owned by your retirement account. There's a very similar way to establish a trust and have a trust be the vehicle that your retirement account uses, but there are subtle differences. With the management of an LLC, the account holder of the IRA can be the manager. But with a trust, it cannot be the client. It has to be a third-party designated trustee, whether that's a relative, whether that's a trustee service. It cannot be you. So basically, when you need to request any specific money or any transactions to be done, the trustee has to be the one to coordinate and facilitate that. Same thing with check writing purposes. You can write your own checks out of your retirement accounts, LLC. If you have a trust established for your investments, the trustee has to handle that. The ownership is titled in the name of the LLC versus the trust. That's pretty similar. And then with the LLC membership, the IRA is the member of the LLC. The IRA is the grantor or the beneficiary to the trust. So si similar, subtly different. We see way more LLCs than trusts. That's as far as I'll really take that one. <laughs> So forming the checkbook LLC, uh, it's very simple, actually. People can get this done within a few days. The longest timeline or time constraint with forming an LLC is going to be registering the LLC in the state of your choice. Does not necessarily be the, have to be the state of your residence. There's a lot of reasons people go to uh, Delaware, for example, Wyoming, for example. Um, there's a, you know, multitude of different reasons. Again, I'm not here to provide any legal advice either. So that is something you would take amongst yourself to decide, am I good living in California just to register an LLC in the state of California for this purpose? Or are there other jurisdictions that have favorable laws that I'd like to partake or benefit from? Filing the Articles of organization, so basically going to the IRS, irs.gov, getting a tax ID number in the name of this LLC. Um, it's very simple. I've uh, got a uh, guide that I've put together, just a guide of slide um, screenshot slides on how to do that. It takes you 10 minutes. It's really quick. Once you register, though, it could take, depending on how far the IRS is backed up with LLC registrations, could take a week. Sometimes we've seen two weeks. That's usually in high volume time zones or time areas of the year. Um, I registered an LLC myself in November and I got all of my articles and everything in three business days. So um, very fast turnaround time. So you register the LLC in the state of your choice. You get the tax ID number. You then have to generate an operating agreement which is basically the governing document that you provide to us so that we can facilitate the investment transaction. Uh, once we have that operating agreement and we have the tax ID number and you have your articles of organization, we're ready to fund the transaction. All you really need to do is go get a bank account set up. When you're setting up the bank account, it's real simple. You walk into any bank of your choice and you say, hey, I am the manager of this LLC. I'd like to establish a basic business checking account in the name of this LLC. 
Here are my articles of organization. Here's my tax ID number. Let's get this account set up. Where people commonly get into some issues is when they say, hey, my IRA has an LLC and I want to set up a bank account for the IRA. When you're walking into a general financial institution, and again, mind you, I've worked in one of the largest banks in the country, and I've also worked in a small credit union before joining Advanta IRA. The people in that bank branch do not understand self-directed retirement account investing and the nature of checkbook control IRAs. They hear the word IRA, and they want to sell you their retirement account product. It's as simple as that. Sometimes you get caught up when you give them too much information in going through their compliance department and they just genuinely don't understand and it creates a conflict where you're better off just saying, okay, I will take my business elsewhere and walk to the next bank up the road. We have financial institutions that are very familiar and very easy to work with that are, are uh, referral partners of ours for these types of bank accounts. Um, so if you're looking to use Advanta IRA, we could definitely point you in the direction of a few different banks you could utilize. But ultimately, you should be able to go to whatever bank you're already working with or you already prefer and say, hey, just need a basic business checking account. Here's the articles. Here's the tax ID number. I'm the manager. It says so right here on the operating agreement and on the articles of organization. Let's get this bank account set up. So again, filing the LLC articles, most entities are going to have the word or the, the letters LLC on them. Sometimes it's not required, but most states do require it. What we do ask is that you don't use the name Advanta, or if you happen to go with one of uh, the other retirement account administrators, I'm sure they'll say the same thing. Um, just to avoid conflict or potential um, confusion, don't have the name of your retirement account administrator on your uh, LLC's name and don't have the letters or the term IRA on your LLC's name either. Aside from that, name it whatever you want. You can, uh, I've seen some pretty unique names to LLCs. I've just seen John Invest LLC. I, I've seen um, random things that appeal to that person that that have a specific significant impact or, or um, point for that LLC being named. Uh, and it doesn't have to have any direct correlation to retirement account or, or that person's retirement dollars or anything like that for anonymity purposes. You do have to have a registered agent, but usually most people just list themselves and potentially their home or their office address as the registered address and the registered agent. And the management, again, 99% of people appoint themselves as the manager only. You can also appoint yourself and other appointees as the manager of the LLC, um, but it's just important that you are the manager of your own IRA's LLC. <clears throat> so there are certain provisions in drafting the operating agreement that I want to make sure everyone's aware of. Um, you do have to have an effective date of the agreement. You have to name all the members out. Uh, the managers have to be named, and you have to make sure there's two different ways management can be structured in a standard operating agreement. It can be structured as member managed or manager managed. And it's very important that you list this as manager managed because the member is your retirement account. And as a retirement account, it's not a living, breathing person. They can't make management decisions on behalf of the LLC. So uh, when we collect operating agreements from our clients, the main things we look for as we skim through and, and make sure everything's in good order is that the management section lists manager manage, that the manager is listed as the account holder and or anyone else they may want to appoint, and that there's also a breakdown of what's being contributed into the account. In other words, however much of your retirement dollars you're putting into the plan as a capital contribution. Those are key things that need to be indicated um, there's a few other factors here listed as well. How many new members are allowed to be added to the LLC in the future? Uh, how are you going to resolve any issues, if any issues come up between managers or additional members, if you add any? Um, just standard provisions. Most people just either go to an attorney and have an LLC, single member LLC operating agreement drafted up. We have attorneys that we would refer for those types of things. 
on average, they charge between three to five hundred dollars uh, for getting the name you want and then providing you with an operating agreement. A lot of times they'll register the LLC in the state of your choice. They'll register the tax ID number for you. So if you want to be hands off with all of that, it's an option. You just have to find the right attorney or, or CPA tax preparer that's willing to do those types of services for you. It's otherwise very simple. I see a lot of clients simply just Google a uh, single member LLC operating agreement. Um, you can get one off of like Rocket Lawyer and different free services or, or free trial services. Uh, very simple. I've seen a 30 page operating agreement for a single member LLC. I've seen a one and a half page operating agreement for a single member LLC. When a client of ours tells us they want to set one up, we have a templated instruction email we send out that has a shorter version, but a version of bullet points just like this that say, here's the bare minimum you have to have in this operating agreement to move forward. Additional considerations. Um, again, if you're going to remove any managers, if you add yourself plus a, a business partner and you just want to have the contingency in case you guys go separate ways, um, anything else, it's completely up to you. These are just considerations uh, here listed. I'm not going to read through every single one. Um, it, it wouldn't be the best use of our time here today. So managing the LLC, once you have it established, all the cash for any investments you make flow in and out of this LLC's bank account. It should not be commingling your personal finances, your personal bank account. You should not be um, covering expenses for the LLC and then uh, getting reimbursed personally for doing that. That is a red flag. Uh, you should not be paying yourself any compensation for being the manager of your IRA's LLC. Um, you're not allowed to pay yourself you're only being the manager of your LLC to benefit your future self or your future earnings, your retirement account. So for you to draw compensation from that now is effectively taking a non-taxed or non-documented distribution out of your retirement dollars, which in itself is a prohibited transaction or disqualified activity in your account. You can also not open a line of credit with these types of accounts because in order to open up a line of credit, you have to sign a personal guarantee and your retirement account is not a person. So there's no viable way for a retirement account to execute a personal guarantee. You're only allowed to have debit transactions or check writing transactions through these types of accounts. Any line of credit should not be opened. Um, even if it's offered to you to say, no, I, I know the rules here. I'm not allowed to have a line of credit on this account. And the earnings stay in that LLC. If you ever want to use that money for personal purposes, it should flow back from the LLC to the retirement account administrator. So if you're an advanced client, you send an ACH, you send a wire, you send a check back to us, we receive it, get it under deposit in your account as opposed to within your LLC. And then you take a request to distribute that money for personal purposes. Oh, there was one thing I, I missed on that last slide there. You must report the value of the LLC or trust to your administrator annually. That's with any asset you hold, though. There's what's called a fair market valuation requirement. Any asset you hold, you have to value it out of your retirement account at the last known value as close to the end of the calendar year as you can. So with an LLC, a very simple way to do this is you pull the value of the cash in the bank account and the value of any assets you hold. If you hold a piece of property, just go to the tax records on the county or the, the local jurisdiction and look at the assessed value there. If you're invested into a, a syndication or multifamily type space, just go to the general partnership team and say, hey, I know I invested $50,000 into this deal two years ago. Can you tell me what my current value is? And they're usually very familiar because they get this request from all of their retirement account clients and investors. And it's very easy to get those types of reports and documents. You put that together on like an Excel spreadsheet or something like that. And it's very simple. Uh, we've got a lot of educational content. I'm actually doing a webinar next week on specific fair market valuation um, education. Is there a 104 for reporting the asset value? Um, assuming that maybe was intended to say 1040. No, uh, there's no 1040 form. 
Uh, what we have is just Advanta's letterhead. It's a, a fair market value form, and that's what we submit to the IRS. It's not a specific um, uh, lettered or numbered form from the IRS. It, it's just our own document. So what I've talked about up to this point is single member LLC. You can also have multiple members. So if you and a group of friends or you and a group of family members want to partner together into investments, you're allowed to do that. Let's call back to the disqualified persons rules I referenced earlier. I was specifically talking about being on the other side of a transaction. If you recall, uh, buying or selling between someone, sitting on the other side of the table from a deal. But if you're gonna sit on the same side of a table and do a deal together, you can do that with anyone you deem necessary or want to deal with. Uh, so you can join an LLC with your father's retirement account, your spouse's retirement account, your children's retirement accounts, and have what's called a multi-member LLC, uh, where all of the parties have an ownership percentage specifically tied to the dollar amount they brought to the table. Once you set that up and you initially fund into it, the ownership percentage is locked. So let's just say we have three partners and they each put 33,000 in, or let's make it more rounded, four partners and they each put 25,000 in and they make an investment with that $100,000 and then they ultimately need 10 more thousand dollars. In order to appropriately utilize and get that $10,000 into that LLC, they really need each partner to put in two and a half thousand more dollars because Partner A cannot put in all 10. It has to be equal ownership and equal shares. So everyone has to put in the same amount. You cannot have some of the partners add money and other partners not add money. If you're going to do something like that, it's more appropriate and, and specifically appropriate to structure a joint venture agreement as opposed to an LLC. So make sure you're, you're well aware of that. Ownership is locked in when you do a multi-member LLC based on the dollar amount that's brought to the table when it's initially funded and the initial capital contribution is made. And all the money is coming from everybody's retirement account, right? Or the 401k. Since... It does not necessarily need to be everyone's retirement account. So I can partner my retirement account with my personal savings. Let's just say I... Let's say I have $80,000 in savings and I want to make a $100,000 syndication investment. I can put $80,000 into an LLC and put $20,000 of my retirement dollars into an LLC. And that LLC goes and makes a syndication investment. I didn't have a whole $100,000 personally in either myself and my savings account or my retirement account. So I utilize the tactic like a multi-member LLC to strategize and structure that investment appropriately. It does not have to be all retirement accounts or no retirement accounts. It could be a, a split either way. However, 99 different ways, however, that breaks out for the memberships. So when you get the profits, so profit split, you can do that. You can put money, like you put $20,000 on your checking account, your regular checking account. So whatever the profit split on that 20,000 is, that's going to go to your checking account. It does not have to stay in your retirement or uh, self-directed IRA. Is that correct statement? So when you get the profits back into the LLC, when you get the profits back into the LLC, they stay in that LLC until the partners want to pull cash out. And when they pull cash out, it's based on their percentage of ownership. So let's just say with, uh, let's just go back to the 80-20 that I just used as an example. If I make $100,000 investment and 80 came from investor A and 20 came from investor B. If that investment yields a disbursement and, and profit of $10,000 and investor B wanted to pull all of that out, uh, that's perfectly fine, but they can only pull their 20% of those profits out. And if they do that, investor A should also be taking their profit percentage out because if they don't, it'll leave an uneven skew of funds still in the account, thus effectively changing the ownership percentage, if that makes sense. Yeah, but what is going to be the tax implication at that point? That's what I'm thinking. It's going to get convoluted, right? Since you're 
kind of commingling your regular account with your retirement account. And this is like, you know, kind of tax-free money that's sitting in your retirement account of 401k. And this is your paying is an ordinary income that you're trying to mix with. That's the part oh, is clear to yeah. me. Yeah. So the tax implication is null and void for the retirement account investor, but the tax implication for the individual only comes to play when they pull that money out of that LLC. So if for again, for context sake, if I made a $20,000 contribution uh, or a 20% contribution into an LLC uh, as an individual and then pulled profits or proceeds out of that as an individual, there's a tax implication only for me as an individual pulling that money out of that entity. The retirement account component and all the retirement accounts involved do not have a tax implication uh, because they carry the tax shelter of the retirement account. That's why, again, a single member LLC is a more clean and more preferred strategy than the multi-member LLC that we really don't see as much of. I was just sharing it today because it is a, a passive income generating strategy, depending on how it's utilized, uh, that helps people pool resources together uh, to effectively make kind of a, a smaller capacity hedge fund. Or, you know, if you don't have enough to join a syndication by yourself, but you have three or four friends that want to partner together and join a, a syndication deal uh, as an LLC with your retirement dollars, it's a strategy to, to get that together and do so. So let me ask you one more question. I think I was under the impression, and correct me if I was wrong, because I was told in the past that when I'm investing in my own deal, let's say I'm a general partner in a, uh, in a deal, and I wanted to invest in the same deal as an LP, I couldn't invest for my 401k or SDRA, because I was That's told- That's correct, you cannot. So can you shed some light on that as well? Yeah, of course. So it, it, that is the- Example I gave earlier of a disqualified person's rule. If you are on the GP team, if you have a controlling stake of 50% or more, or you make day-to-day -day decisions as a general partner, you should not be using your retirement account as a limited partner in that deal. Now, I have seen syndicators um, with their own legal representation say, hey, I'm on the general partnership team. I do not make day-to-day -day decisions nor as a general partner, do I have 50% or more controlling stake. If you're able to line those factors out and have your own legal representation saying that they believe this is a clear and viable transaction for your retirement account, again, we're an asset administrator. We're not a fiduciary. We're not here to stop you from making that transaction. We are very diligently and thoroughly going to make sure you're aware of the considerations, make sure you have that legal um, kind of person on your team or background to support if you're ever um, challenged for making that transaction in the future. Um, but unless those factors are met, you don't make day-to-day -day decisions and you're less than 50% controlling stake as a general partner, um, you should not even facilitate the idea of using your retirement dollars as a limited partner in a deal that you're a GP on. Basically, you're not allowed to invest into your own deals because of the capacity of day-to-day uh, -day decision making on the GP side. Um, and just in general, it's something we see much less of. I mean, I've seen it done, uh, but in the limited cases that I've seen it done, there was a bunch of additional underwriting that an attorney went through to, to kind of check off that that was a viable investment. It, it's much more clear and easier. Um, to just partner with someone potentially, just for example's sake, um, hey, I'm a syndicator, I have this great deal, you're a syndicator, you have this great deal, I'll invest my money into your deal, you invest your money into my deal. That's a safer way that has no red flag or no precautionary you know, factors involved. Thank you. So there's, mm -hmm. a, I think, question or comment from Charles. He says, I think an LLC has to pay tax on gains or distribute. The IRA owner would not have tax at that time, but non-IRA would have to take the distributions, right? Can you read that? Yeah, I, I believe so. I'm, I'm reading it here. I think an LLC has to pay tax on gains or distributions. The IRA owner would not have to pay tax at that time, which is correct, but a non-IRA would have to take the distribution. I believe so. Um, again, the income generated by an IRA's investment would remain in the LLC. 
I'm sorry, the income generated by an LLC's investment would remain in the LLC until the partners agreed to take distributions out. Um, the non-IRA partner does not necessarily need to distribute out of that LLC once the income is generated. Um, there should be bookkeeping and record keeping that says, okay, everyone put this share of ownership in, we made this investment, this investment yielded this return, this return is subject to be broken out by this share of ownership here, 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 however that breaks out. That doesn't necessarily mean that any specific non-RA partners, <laughs> yes, but the IRS wants blood. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to deny that factor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think we got the point across there, though. <laughs> Um, just a few more, um, how to move cash from an LLC or a trust. Um, again, I, I went over this earlier without even showing the slide, but, um, you move the money into the retirement account with a simple transaction. When you make investments, you have to move the money out of the LLC or trust back to the retirement account administrator. And then you take it personally for personal purposes. That is so it can be properly documented to the IRS, um, typically on form 1099, 1099R specifically. Pros and cons of checkbook control. Pros, it's easier to keep arm's length transaction from your IRA. Uh, you can have a clear record of all activity when your Using your IRA, you have quick access to the funds. You can hold more assets in the IRA with lower fees. So I'm not going to get into the specific dollars, uh, but our fee agreement is very simple. It's structured that our clients pay either a flat rate per asset they hold with us, which is what 80%, if not more, of our clients utilize, a flat rate per asset. Or well, the other option is a flat rate billed quarterly based on the total value of your account with us. So if you're someone that you know your retirement account value is going to fluctuate, that may be a better fit for you so that on down quarters of the year of your retirement account valuation, you're getting charged less. Um, that's really for people that are just getting their retirement account started or have highly volatile assets that they're investing into. But most of the time, it's a flat rate per asset. And when you think about how many assets you may want to hold in your retirement account, you can multiply that number whatever it is by X uh, compared to holding all of those assets within an LLC where the only asset on our books and our records that we're billing you off of is having an LLC. Everything else you're doing within the LLC, we're not billing you additional for. So you could have four assets held directly by an administrator that you're paying you know, four times asset maintenance fees for, or you could have four assets held within an LLC and you're just paying the retirement account administrator to administer the LLC in itself. Um, there's additional asset protection and anonymity. Again, you can name the LLC, whatever you want. Um, the retirement account is going to be shown on public record as the owner of the LLC. So you can even have it slated where it just shows your retirement account administrator and a number, and no one would really be able to tie, even if they did as much digging as possible, your personal name back to your retirement account investment or back to the LLC that your retirement account made an investment through. Um, it's easier to make investment with partners, and you can hold a number of different asset classes. Again, I went over how diverse a self-directed account is in general. Um, the checkbook control strategies lets you kind of pool all that diversity together into one managed uh, capacity. The cons, um, well, the cons is if you don't have a, a checkbook control, you're not able to just write checks immediately or, or have a debit card to execute transactions. Um, you are responsible for record keeping. So where we do a lot of record keeping and documentation for you, you would be more responsible for that. So it may be if you're someone that doesn't like handling that type of thing, where you have to consider employing a bookkeeper or using QuickBooks or something like that for, for that type of stuff. Um, there's less oversight. So again, you're more liable or, or you have the door open a little bit further and the more onus on you to make sure you're not doing prohibited transactions and, and uh, disqualified behaviors. And if you ever need a capital call or additional monies when you have multiple partners, that's going to be a factor involved. If not every partner can contribute their fair share of the ownership percentage, then no one can contribute. You can't just have three of the four partners add more money and that one partner just say, I'm going to uh, not add money this round. It's not allowed. No one's allowed to add if you can't have everyone add their fair share.
Getting the tax ID number, I'm not going to hone in on this page. I went over it verbally earlier. It's a very simple process. I don't even, the SS4 document basically is generated online now with a, it's four or five pages that you slide through. It takes you 15 minutes on irs.gov. It's really easy. Opening the bank account. These are pretty much the considerations I went over earlier. Um, don't get a credit card, only use debit transactions or an actual checkbook. You can set this up at any bank of your choice, any credit union of your choice. The more you use the word IRA or the term IRA or, or reference that it's your retirement dollars, uh, the more liable you're going to be to getting tied up in the bank's policies or trying to get sold a retirement product. Or maybe, unfortunately, as I've seen before, they actually accidentally set you up a retirement account. So you, if that's a traditional or a tax deferred retirement account, you're getting into a whole mess of tax problems by putting your tax sheltered retirement account dollars into another tax sheltered retirement account. I've, I've had to help a woman unwind that and it was uh, not fun. <laughs> uh, funding the account, super easy. It, it roughly takes about a week to a week and a half usually to get your money moved over from another retirement account to a self-directed administrator, get your LLC records in order and set up and registered, and then get the retirement dollars sent to the LLC's bank account roughly a week and a half. I'd say two weeks is a conservative estimate just to give yourself space and breathing room, uh, but we can usually get that done within about seven to 10 days. If you're a brand new person that doesn't even have an account with us, if you have an account with us, um, shoot, it could be as quick as two to three business days. If you maybe already have an LLC that you've never used before, you just set it up back in the day and left it dormant for as long as you're you're thinking about it. It's very easy, very quick, and we can get that transaction turned around very fast. This is pretty much just outlining the actual process. Um, let me go back one slide. So just the case study here. Joe has $150,000 with a, a, another retirement company, and he decides he wants to make some alternative investments. He comes, sets up a self-direct account, gets the money moved over from his other account, which typically takes three to five business days or so, gets the LLC registered, gets the operating agreement, gets the tax ID number, opens up a bank account, provides a van to all those documents. We execute the transaction, wire the funds into that LLC's bank account. And then Joe has control to do what he wants, makes investments in the name of that LLC as he sees fit and invest into anything. Uh, again, that's not a prohibited asset or, or a disqualified transaction by way of the persons he's dealing with. So what strategy is best for you? Maybe you sat through this whole webinar and learned a lot, but decided, oh, there's too much onus on me. I don't want the headache of having to manage this uh, LLC account or worry if the transactions I want to do are prohibited or not. Then maybe you've just learned a great deal about this and this strategy is not for you. But if you're more entrepreneurial driven and you do have the mindset that you want to do checkbook control, you want to have quick access to your retirement dollars and you want to be able to quote wheel and deal a bit faster than waiting for normal business hours to contact your client account manager and get a transaction underway, then it could be a great strategy for you. I'm not here to push you on either side of the fence. I'm here to just lay out the information, make sure again, as thorough as possible, I'm, I'm making sure you understand and uh, and know the rules and the regulations and the possibilities and let you self-direct your retirement account from there. Oh, went the wrong way. So just uh, the kind of final page here, the key takeaway points I want everyone to have. Checkbook control is a great strategy for investors that are seeking flexibility and freedom. There are specific considerations for setting up an LLC or a trust or a solo 401k with checkbook control. Um, Again, the operating agreement, the management, the member, the tax ID. And any person using these types of accounts needs to know that the funds flow only through the accounts set up for the retirement product or the LLC, the trust, the solo 401k. You should not be commingling personal funds, covering any expenses on behalf of the retirement account investment and reimbursing yourself or paying yourself any compensation. Uh, it's all strictly your future self, your future earnings. Think of it as a completely separate entity than you. And that has to stay completely separate because that's how the IRS thinks of it. Again, 
until they come for blood. <laughs> um, we do a ton of education. I, I, I modify what you've seen today from one of our educational webinars. Um, we typically put out two of those educational webinars a week. We also have a podcast my colleague Alex Perney hosts called the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. Uh, we have a blog for really kind of nerdy industry standard news about the retirement investing industry. Being that we're entering an election year, there may be some legislation that affects your ability to use self-directed retirement funds. So if you want to stay on the cutting edge of that information and, and know what um, what things to speak to your lawmakers about as far as passing or, or rejecting, check out our blog. It's really easy to set up an account with us, 15 minutes to complete our application. We'll get the account set up and funded and ready to invest within a week to a week and a half, like I said earlier. Here's my contact information again. Thank you all for your time. I appreciate it. I hope I've been helpful. I hope I've added value to your evening. And uh, if there's anything else I can do or speak with you about, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thanks, Corey.